We're at the end now of chapter 6, our study on chapter 6 of our confession, which is about the fall of man, of sin, and the punishment thereof. Just think about what we've discussed now for these past several weeks. We've considered the fall in history and in the plan of God. Historically, biblically, we find it right there in Genesis chapter 3. And everything changes in the world after sin has entered. The world is cursed. Humanity becomes corrupt. Uh, at the same time, we know that this was no accident, no cosmic accident. This was actually decreed by God, part of the plan of God. Uh, and one piece of the puzzle of God's ultimate plan to redeem sinners for Himself so that He would be glorified for all eternity. And then we looked at the results of the fall. What actually happens to the world and everything in it? What actually happens to us, image bearers of God, beginning with Adam, now that sin has been committed and now that sin has infected us all? And we know that because of sin, we're all sinners. We're in a world cursed. Because of sin, there is decay, there is corruption, there is death. And we know that this sinful nature that Adam had is now transmitted through ordin by ordinary generation, but at the same time, we know that we inherit his original sin, his original guilt, simply by virtue of being in the covenant of works, of which he is the representative. He sinned, he's guilty, therefore in him we sinned, we are guilty. And then we thought about original sin and its fruit. When you are conceived, you already have this original corruption. You're already depraved. You're already a little infant sinner. But then out of that original corruption flow all actual transgressions. Okay? Now, just to anticipate a later chapter about um, effectual calling, we do know that something in the heart of man radically changes when you are born again. When the sinner is saved, born again, given heavenly life, united to Christ, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, there is a change. But, contrary to what some movements have taught historically, this does not mean that therefore the born-again believer achieves sinlessness. It doesn't mean, just because you've been born again, that you will now be fully and completely and totally victorious over all sin. And that brings us to, to paragraph 5 of our confession, which talks about, which is about sin and the believer. Now this is almost elementary for us, right? Christians still sin. Do you, do you agree? Do you believe that? Do you affirm that? Christians still sin. So let's just um, think back to paragraph 4. This is what we learned last week. From this original corruption, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed all actual transgressions. Now, as we come to paragraph 5, we have... Some brief statements here, or a brief statement here, about what's called the first motions of sin. And we'll read that in just a second. I want to introduce to you a word. It is not commonly used anymore today, um, but in history it was used many times by theologians. The word is concupiscence. Can you say concupiscence? concupiscence. Does anybody know? Or have any idea what concupiscence means? Something knowledge. Something knowledge? Uh. <laughs> With? You're just looking. Okay. All right. Well, um, does any, is, did somebody raise their hand there? No? Yes? Concupiscence? Anyone? Something about what? Something about recovering or healing? No, it's, it's not that. The first desire. And that's what's being spoken of here in paragraph 5 when it says that even the 
first motions of sin are truly and properly sin. Concupiscence is that original or that, that, sorry, that initial desire to sin. And we're going to find out something interesting here. And that is that even the initial desire to sin is already sin. That's how serious our sin problem is, even as born-again believers. You know, you may hear people who say, hey, you thought about doing it, but at least you didn't do it. You're all good. Don't worry about it. You didn't sin. Now, in the sense of actually committing the crime, that is true. You did not sin. But biblically, even that first desire, that first consideration, when you first looked at that temptation and thought, hey, that might be a good idea, is in itself already sinful. So let's read together paragraph 5 of our confession in chapter 6. The corruption of nature during this life does remain in those that are regenerated. And although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and the first motions thereof are truly and properly sin. I want you to see the sin chain reaction here, okay? Original corruption, that's just the state of sinful man. Yes, when we are born again, we are regenerated and given new life, but corruption remains. So here's the remaining corruption, and then here's the actual transgression, okay? Here's the original, uh, the remaining corruption, and then here is the actual committing of sin. Let's just say murder, okay? The act of murder, actually killing someone unjustly, flows out of the corruptions of my flesh, okay? Now, there is, in a sense, you could say, an in-between the two, okay? There is that in-between place of simply considering, thinking about, initially wanting to murder. You see, this is why Jesus is able to say, I think you know where I'm going, in Matthew chapter 5, that even if you get angry with a brother in your heart, you're liable to judgment. See, someone can easily say, look, I only thought all night about stabbing that man. When I woke up the next day, I never actually did it. I'm completely innocent in all of this, and I have not sinned against God. Whereas the Bible would say, oh, thankfully you didn't actually kill that guy because the consequences on earth would be far worse for you. But the fact that you meditated that evening considering potentially, maybe, because you desire to murder that man, those first motions, and I think there you've already gone beyond even the first motions, are truly and properly sin. So two things we need to know. Christians have remaining corruption, and therefore Christians still sin. And that includes those first motions. So firstly, Christians have remaining corruption. Take note, as we've seen in a previous paragraph, People are conceived in sin, and by nature children of wrath, the servants of sin, and although it be through Christ, oh sorry, the servants of sin, the subjects of death, and all other miseries, unless the Lord Jesus set them free. That's from paragraph 3. That is the state of man unless the Lord Jesus set them free. And then we read in paragraph 5, the corruption of nature, you still have corruption, during this life does remain in those that are regenerated. It remains. There's still indwelling sin. And the reason why there's still some sin in you is because there is still some corruption in you. You're still imperfect. So the point is, even though we've been set free from sin and death, you're no longer under law, but under grace, there is still remaining corruption in the believer. Romans chapter 7 verse 18 and later in 23 says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin. That dwells in my members. So there is still remaining sin because there is still remaining corruption 
so long as we remain in this body, so long as we remain in the flesh. That's why Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. A couple of ways you could see um, what this verse is trying to get at, but one thing we can clearly see here is look at the statement. There's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. I mean, in one sense, you could say, even the most righteous of the righteous, not a single one of them exists that does not sin. 1 John 1, 8, speaking to Christians, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So even though there have been many Christians, and, and still are in the world, who teach this doctrine of sinless perfectionism, that if you really get sanctified, and if you really achieve a certain level of walking with the Lord and holiness, you can actually stop sinning. Um, even though many Christians have taught that and believe that, um, we believe that that doctrine is a very dangerous doctrine. And it goes against the clear teaching of the Bible that we still have indwelling sin. So let's see what the difference actually is between before be gen regeneration and after. Yes, Sam. Um, how, do you, how do you distinguish between the first motions of sin and temptation, like in Hebrews 4.15, how it talks about how Jesus is our great high priest, yeah. he's able to sympathize with us, and, and it says he has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Yes, so the distinction, the important distinction there, which we can talk about more when we talk about the will of man, is the distinction between temptation from within and temptation from without. We experience temptation from within because as James 1 says, where do all these lusts come from? They come from your heart. All those temptations. He is tempted when he is enticed by his own desires. That's what James says. Jesus, when it speaks of him experiencing temptation there, it is temptation from without. Such as, for example, Satan going to him and seeking to entice the righteous Lord Jesus to betray his God. He, I'm going to give you all of the kingdoms, I'm going to give you all of these things, but he fended that, he fought off that temptation, he rebuked that temptation, and he was successful, and he did not sin in doing so, because that, and all the temptations Jesus ever experienced, was never a temptation from the lust of his own heart, but temptations from without. Similarly, therefore, we can speak of somebody, even you as a person, somebody trying to entice you into something, but because maybe that sin in your heart is mortified, even the moment that that comes to you, you just go, nah, no interest. As opposed to when that temptation comes and you entertain and you ponder and you consider it, that's the first motions. Thanks for the question. So difference between the will of man before being born again and after. Number one, I mean, firstly, letter D, the will of fallen man is in bondage to sin. Uh, we read later in our confession in chapter 9, paragraph 3, that man, by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to even prepare himself thereunto. It's not just that you can't finally come to Jesus to be saved. You can't even do the things that are necessary to get you to that first step. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that even us, we Christians, we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. This is the will of fallen man. In bondage, because of the corruption, because of the sin, they're totally depraved. And then we get to the will of the born-again believer. <clears throat> you see, the will of the born-again believer is no longer in bondage. Sin is no longer your master. But we do know that some sin still remains because of the remaining corruption. But sin is no longer your master. So we read in Romans chapter 6, verse 5 onwards here, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. <clears throat> we know that our old self, old self, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved 
to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So also you must consider yourselves, listen to this, dead to sin, once for all, uh, dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So look at what's being said here. First of all, you're already dead to sin. The old you has been crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Yet, there's an exhortation here that you still need to actively let not sin reign in your mortal body to make it obey your passions. Don't present your members to sin. Instead, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. The mere fact that that is an imperative, don't give in to sin, do submit to God, means that even though you've been crucified, you're, the old you is dead, and you are now in Christ, and you are now alive in Him in a new and everlasting way, these imperatives, these commands still exist because there's still a battle. You are not yet glorified. Sin still remains. But we read again later in chapter 9, paragraph 4 of our confession, that when God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, that's where you are right now, you were in a state of dead and sin, and now you're in a state of grace, he frees him from his natural bondage under sin, and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. So you can actually obey God now. You, you can do things which are truly pleasing to him. You can love him. Yet, so as that by reason of his remaining corruptions, there it is, remaining corruptions, he does not perfectly, nor only will that which is good, but does also will that which is evil. So we still sin. We still give in to temptation at times. Um, as many theologians of the past have put it, humanity undergoes, or at least the full realm of it, a fourfold state. There's before the fall, where Adam was truly able to sin or able to do righteousness, okay? He had a will that was not in bondage to sin. He was created upright, and he had the ability in that state to either do what is right or to sin against God. Because he sinned, and now man is corrupt, because we are depraved, right? The state of humanity, the natural state of humanity now is that we are in bondage to sin. We are always sinning. And even the good deeds that we do do are like filthy rags in the eyes of a holy God. Even the most virtuous acts of humanity, outside of the grace of God, they are still tainted with sin, with sinful motive, with selfishness, with idolatry, with whatever sin it may be. And then you get born again if you are part of God's people. And this is the third thing. Now, what's your state? You are, once again, able to sin or able to do that which is good. And because we're born again, yet still in the flesh, a life is filled with both. We still sin, but by the grace of God, we can, we are able, and we do, do those things that please God. And as we grow in Christ, we are able to put sin to death more and more. And no, we do not believe in perfect sinlessness, but we do believe that by the grace of God, Christians can sin less. And Christians can grow in righteousness. Christians can grow in holiness. Christians can become more obedient to our amazing God. 
because so much changes. Our hearts change, our minds change, our lives change, our desires change, our relationship with the law of God changes. It used to be this thing that simply condemns us, but now it's a, it's a way of life. We see the goodness of God when He tells us to live in a certain way. It's a command coming from a loving Heavenly Father. And we're thinking to ourselves, yes, I do want to walk in this way. I do want to walk the steps that God has ordained for me to walk, to walk in the good works that He's prepared for me beforehand, because I know that His ways are higher than my ways. So this does happen to the Christian. Yet, we never become sinless. Sometimes we willfully, blatantly, still sin against our God. Sometimes, we still act a lot like those in the world. And even some of the seemingly stablest Christians can even fall to grievous, heinous sins. Christians can sin, and they still sometimes sin big time. That brings us to the second point. Christians still sin. Our confession continues, and although it be through Christ, pardoned and mortified, speaking of our our sinful nature, pardoned and mortified, our corrupt nature, yet both itself and the first motions thereof are truly and properly sin. Okay? We don't get a free pass. We're pardoned. Our sins are being put to death, but we don't get to go, I'm in a state of grace now. So when I sin, it's not really sin. It's not really that bad. It's very much excusable. It's not as bad as when the unbeliever sins. Well, actually, one can argue when the Christian sin, when the Christian sins, it's even worse than when the unbeliever sins. Because we're talking very clearly about that which he or she knows cost the life of Jesus Christ to be paid for. We know the cost of our sin. We know the, 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 the depths that Jesus went to, the heights and depths that Jesus went to, just so that we might be pardoned of that sin. And so that those sins would be washed away from us. In fact, he took those sins upon himself as he bore the wrath of God on the cross of Calvary. So, yes, when the Christian sins, it is truly and properly sin. Um, As um, Dr. James Renahan in his commentary on the confession states, quote, Coming to faith in Jesus Christ effects a profound change. But it is not complete so long as we live in this world. Believers are truly through Christ pardoned, and the forgiveness is real and cannot be revoked. Nevertheless, the justified sinner will struggle in this life with the remaining effects of sin. Uh, Later in chapter 3, paragraph 1, we read that the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified. So this is the good news for the Christian. We are not left under the mastery of sin. There is an actual change. There is a new direction. You are no longer under law, but under grace. You are no longer to have sin. This is actually not a command. This is a a, a statement. Sin no longer has dominion over you. He continues, Together these paragraphs teach us important lessons. Regeneration imparts new life, but the believer groans, waiting for the day of full redemption when body and soul are united in God's presence forever. In this life, sin will continue to manifest its presence. God's Spirit is at work in every believer, even while sin remains within. So you might think to yourself, man, if I really do still have remaining corruption, and my heart is not yet absolutely, actually, practically perfect in every way, Even when I do good works and I obey God, wouldn't it be still tainted with some of that sin? Even the good deeds that I do for my brothers and sisters at church, sometimes aren't there still in the motives behind that some corruptions? And look, the answer is yes. But here again is what separates you from those outside of Christ. Jesus 
is a perfect and sufficient mediator between you and God. He stands in the gap between you and God. So when you, by the power of the Spirit, begin to obey God, even though it is sometimes tainted with some sin, it's as if Jesus... Um, you know, see, see, your, see your good works as something that is of service to God, being offered up to God, right? Jesus is the great high priest who, it's as if he takes our good works and he washes and purifies them and makes them acceptable. And by the time that the Father, there's no actual time frame in between this, okay? I'm just using language this way. By the time that the Father then receives this service of yours, these good works for his glory, do you know how he sees them and treats them? It's as if they were performed by his one and only son himself. That's how good it is to be united to Christ. So we can obey God. We can please God. And if there are still some remaining corruptions, that's washed away. That's purified. And the the Father in heaven is genuinely pleased with the obedience of his children. Not to mention the fact that it is Christ by His Spirit who is working in you anyway to actually will and to do that which is pleasing to God. What an amazing salvation we have in Christ. What amazing grace. So, we still got sin. Yep. Yes. And that He would discipline us. Yes. Because he loves us. But then when we do good works, is there some sense in which we're rewarded in any way? Um, is there a contrast? Yeah, there? There, there, there's, um, there's a lot in Scripture that speak of rewards. I mean, there's definitely talk about eternal rewards. Now, when it comes to temporal rewards, um, it's actually interesting because the Bible seems to um, prize the, the concept that in the Christian's obedience, we, we do receive a reward. And that reward is greater than any temporal reward. And that is the, loving, the, the, the smiling face of the Father upon you. That is the presence of God himself. That is a greater and greater manifestation of God's love and good pleasure towards you. Um, sometimes the biggest blessing in obeying God is the fact that you are obeying God. And for the Christian, he is able to be content even with just the thought of that. That by the grace of God, look at us. Look at us. We're obeying. We're we're actually doing that which us, by our nature, would have never even wanted to do in the first place. Look what God has done. And that in itself is a great encouragement and a kind of reward even to the Christian here on earth. What's a, what would be a, a good way to think about, you know, we don't, there's not a lot of talk about eternal rewards. Yes. How should we even think about that? We'll spend a lot of time on that when we get to the chapter on good works, what it actually means. But eternal rewards are real. There are rewards in heaven for the life that we lived on earth. Um, we'll go into more detail, but I will, I will definitely say this, just as, I think, a helpful thought. Um, the crowns and the rewards, you want to call them medals, whatever it is that the saints of God receive, um, which are commensurate to the life of service that they have lived on earth. Um, When we enter into glory, though, and we go into the eternal state, there's not going to be like a hierarchy. There's not going to be a podium, first place, second place, third place, fourth place, and all of that. But... What will be true is that those will be recognized that this is great service, that's great service, look at this and look at that and so on. But in the end, the glory will all go to the God who prepared those good works beforehand. And it's as if those who receive the crown of righteousness will throw them at the feet of Jesus Christ, acknowledging, wait a minute, these are yours. These really are your treasures. These are rewards that would have never been mine if it weren't for the work that you did in my life. Um, that, that doesn't diminish the fact that there are very much eternal rewards based on the lives that we have lived as Christians. So we've still got sin, and what is sin? According to 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the law. Christians still transgress God's law. That's why, again, Romans 7, But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am! 
Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. A constant struggle. In fact, let me tell you this. One of the things that many Christians struggle with is this issue of assurance. Is my salvation real? Is my faith real? Am I really in Christ? Can I truly have confidence that I belong to Him? And there can be many reasons that one struggles with assurance. Okay? And definitely sin is a primary reason. But oftentimes you will hear a Christian say, Hey, I've been struggling with these besetting sins. Or I have this old sin that I thought I put to death, but then it reared its ugly head into my life again and it came back. I don't know where it came from, but I'm struggling with it again. And now I'm wondering, am I really a Christian? Here's an interesting um, way to look at those things. This is not going to be true for everyone. You could be deceptive to yourself. You could give in to self-deception, right? But generally speaking, the unregenerate, unbeliever, who does not have a new heart, who is dead in their sins, and has no true love for God. You see, they don't struggle with sin. To properly struggle with sin, there needs to actually be a back and forth battle between the spirit and the flesh. The unbeliever does not have the spirit of God. They can sometimes have a guilty conscience. They can feel remorse. Paul in Corinthians speaks about a kind of repentance that is not a true spiritual repentance, but one that just leads to depression and being downcast and hopelessness. But the one with the Spirit of God, what makes you so unique is not simply that you sin less. What, what makes you unique and different from those in the world is that even though you do have sin, there is a war being waged in your flesh. There is a battle, a spiritual battle, between the spirit and the flesh. You, you are not happy, nor settled, nor okay when sin is getting the best of you. Without the spirit of God, we don't wrestle with sin. We lay down and let us, let us be eaten up by it. We love it. We enjoy it. We're not that bothered by it. Maybe the really bad ones, the skeletons in your closet, some of the more, you know, some of the bigger more prominent sins. Oh, I really feel bad about that one because even the unbelieving culture sh thinks that it's shameful. Uh, but when it comes to normal, everyday, respectable sins and whatnot, um, you might, you know, pass by a church and hear a, a sermon about the vice of curiosity and you're, you're not really a believer or anything like that. You'd be like, I don't care. <laughs> like, you, know, you can't tell me I can't be curious. What is this guy talking about, right? You're just going to walk on by. You're not bothered by that. That's a... You're a Christian, you're born again, and maybe you have given in to this sin many, many times, and you will listen to that word being preached, and you would go, oh, that's not good. That's not good. This, this, is, this is something. This is something that I need to think about. This is something that I need to deal with. This is something that I'm completely eaten up by, and now I feel like I need to do something about it, right? So that, that is one of the differences. Christians still transgress the law, but, Galatians 5.17, the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There is a, a battle. There is warfare within you. But, as we've already learned, the good news is that even though sin wants to fool you into thinking that it still has dominion over you, it actually doesn't. Dear Christian, Sin no longer has dominion over you. It still exists. You still struggle with it. But he who is in you is stronger than he who is in the world, first of all. And also, the Spirit of God will ensure that the work that he began in you, he will bring to completion. Now, we continue. Here's the next point. That even the first motions of sin are sinful. So again, to illustrate... Actually committing murder is clearly a sin, but contemplating murdering someone is also itself a sin. Now, here's one bad sinful thing that we can do when we come to that conclusion. Oh, lusting after someone who's not my spouse is already adultery of the heart, so I might as well go all the way with it. 
all right? I mean, I've already done it anyway. OK, no, don't go that route. It is not saying that the two are actually the same and or equal with one another. There's a greater and greater degree of sinfulness if you keep on going. Nevertheless, what, the, what we are being told here is that, yeah, but it is true. Even that first motion in itself was already sinful to begin with. And you know what? This is actually one of the things that when the world looks at Christianity, they see it as it's, it's suffocating. At least proper understanding of biblical Christianity with a high view of the law of God and a biblical understanding of sin. It's like, yeah, you guys, you Christians. Like, I mean, for many of us, it's already hard enough not to, uh, not to sleep around. And then we go to you guys, and you guys are now saying that even if I just look and think about something lustful, I'm already sinning. Like, what, what kind of life is this? What kind of cosmic killjoy is your God? Thought crimes? Is this what you guys are teaching? You just think about doing something bad, and you're already held accountable to it? Well, the world might have different interpretations of that, but in essence, yes. Even the sinful thoughts, the first motions, the initial temptations is already sin. Um, Francis Turretin, the later Puritan author, writes that the initial impulses of the corruptions of nature do not cease to be sins, although they are neither wholly voluntary nor in our power. That's an interesting statement. So, when you get that intrusive thought of something sinful, in one sense you could say that wasn't exactly voluntary. You ever experienced that? It wasn't like you worked hard to get there. Like you were thinking of something, but then a sinful thought came in seemingly from out of nowhere, and it didn't really feel very much voluntary. And, and, and it's true. Sometimes there's, there's, it's less voluntary. It kind of just comes because of something that you've seen before, thought before, said before, a strange memory from the past or something, and an intrusive sinful thought just blindsides you. And look, if, if, you're, if you're a Christian who is serious about putting to death sin, you've experienced that, and you go, oh, stop, stop, no, 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 okay, okay, stop, go, go away, go away. I'm not going to think about that right now. I'm thinking about good things right now. I'm not going to think about that bad stuff. I'm thinking about good things. Um, and that's good. That is how you should treat it. But again, with a high view of the law of God, I want you to know that even the intrusive sinful thought is not nonetheless a sinful thought. You know what I'm saying? It's still a sinful thought. Now, what this teaching should do to us is not cripple us to the point of saying, I have no hope, even in my sleep I sin. In fact, <laughs> Martin Luther um, famously said, um, and this is, I'm quoting Luther, okay? Don't take it from me. This is just, this is just something you'll find um, quoted in many places. Um, he says, when you're awake, you sin a lot. When you're asleep, I think you don't sin, right? And he loved his German beer. And he said, so if you drink beer, you'll probably sin less. You'll sleep earlier and better, and you'll sin less. So therefore, drink German beer. That's, <laughs> that's an actual Luther quote. Now, he's probably being cheeky about that. Um, and he probably knew a lot about this concupiscence stuff. Um, and in all of his cheekiness, I'm sure someone like Martin Luther, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about him right now because we're going to talk about him this evening. Um, he knows that um, there is a way for us to still be sinning, um, even in many of the things that aren't completely voluntary, right? And so... That thought shouldn't cripple us into thinking I'm absolutely hopeless. What that thought should do is go and make you run to Christ who is able to put to death not only the actual transgressions in action, Jesus has the power to put to, put to death even those initial first motions of sin. So for example, before I go to you, Maybe once upon a time, you were very immature, you're very childish. You hear something that is lewd. Uh, you hear something in school. The teacher said, you know, something um, silly, a sexual innuendo. And the first thing that comes to mind, you can't help it. You go, ha, ha. You just laugh about it, and you just make this um, silly, lewd joke, right? That is immoral, right? As you grow and as you mature, Lord willing, as you surrender yourself to Christ and as the Spirit works in your life, you begin to hear things that when you were a child, it made you think of lewd things, but now you hear it and you don't, you don't really think of those things. 
And again, that's not 100% voluntary, but, but that is how Christ holistically works in the life of the believer. You grow and you mature, and, and those immoral things that used to provoke your thoughts a certain way, now maybe no longer do, or at least do less. Yep. So you were saying like Martin Luther said in our dream, in our sleep we don't sin. Yeah, I knew what I about shouldn't sinful have, dreams? I knew I shouldn't have quoted Luther there. What about like sinful dreams though? Because yeah. Because they come from our subconscious anyway, don't that's they? That's such a perfect example. So one could argue that's hardly voluntary. Yes, yeah, true, but it's still coming from somewhere. Now, let me give you a couple of, a couple of um, places where that could come from. First of all, it could come from your actual indulging in sin, in your awake life. Isn't that commonly the case? You're indulging in sin in your awake life, so therefore you start to see that sin pop up and you indulge in it in your asleep life, which is not voluntary as much as the awake life, but it still comes from somewhere. You still have a responsibility. On the other hand, even if we take that away, what we're being taught is that at the end of the day, it's still sin in the sense that it flows from the remaining corruptions. So it's not alien from you. You were not innocent and then somebody just implanted these sinful notions in your mind and you dreamt about it and you go, I've been infected by somebody else's sin that they placed in me. No, that is no less your sin. It's no less flowing from the corruption that remains in your flesh. That's what we're saying here. So, um, we affirm over and against, historically, the Arminians, the Romanists, and the Socinians, who taught that concupiscence, the inclination, the first motive, the first motion uh, to sin, was not sinful. Did you know that? So, officially, uh, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that concupiscence is not necessarily a sin. Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church says that the inclination to sin that tradition calls concupiscence is left for us to wrestle with, but it cannot harm those who do not consent. Concupiscence stems from the disobedience of the first sin. It unsettles man's moral faculties and without being in itself an offense, inclines man to commit sin. Do you see what they're saying there? This is why um, in the modern context, there are some, I don't know how knowledgeable they are that, that they're doing this, but when it comes to the gender stuff debates and the homosexuality and so on debates, there are some within Christian circles who have begun to deny that concupiscence is a sin. What do I mean by that? The notion that maybe you've heard that when it comes to homosexual attraction, if you get attracted to the opposite sex in that disorderly and unnatural and ungodly way, it, it, it is by definition ungodly because it's, un, uh, it's against God's design that men would look sexually upon a man or in any kind of romantic sense, right? But there are many that have come to teach that if you desire that man of the same sex, you are not necessarily sinning if you do not act upon it. Now, that's not that bad. I mean, praise God that we're clear that you should not act upon homosexual desires, just like you should not act upon any sinful desires, right? But it is wrong to somewhat excuse the desire and say that it's not necessarily sin. There's something wrong with that. Why? Because biblically, we would say, you need to repent even of that desire. You need to repent even of that first motion, which is flowing out of the remaining corruption in you. Okay? You need to put that to death. And a real Christian, by the way, can still struggle with that. A real Christian can struggle with that, much like they struggle with other disorderly passions and sins. But it would be a disservice to them as a church if we told them, oh, you still think and feel this way and desire that? That's okay. Just don't do anything. Just don't say anything. Just, just don't approach the person. Just keep it in here. No, we would say that even the first motions are sin, and you need to repent of that. And by the grace of God, unlike what secularism teaches, we believe that people who struggle with those desires actually can overcome them with the help of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the power of the gospel. 
So take note, this disagreement with Rome and some other people that teach this hits at the heart of the biblical doctrine of total depravity. Uh, John Calvin writes that concupiscence should be called not merely weakness, as the Roman Catholics did, but sin. We label sin that very depravity which begets in us desires of this sort. We accordingly teach that in the saints, until they are divested of mortal bodies, there is always sin. For in their flesh there resides the depravity of inordinate desiring which contends against righteousness. Okay? You're, you're married. You get into a fight with your spouse. That initial thought, oh, what if you just disappeared? <laughs> you know, when you say, what if, what if today you get, you, know, you get so angry and you, you don't say anything, you walk out and everything, and you start thinking to yourself like, oh, what if you just died, just disappeared? You dwell on that a little bit and you go, oh, well, if I had a different wife, well, if I had a different husband, yeah, that's right, you're already sinning. You're already sinning. Those first motions, you've already gone even beyond that initial motion, I would say. But what do we read in James chapter 1? Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. Listen to this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Where does it come from? It comes from in here. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, actual sins, acts of sin, external acts of sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So this should challenge us, dear Christians. Seek to put even that first arousal of temptation to death. You see, as Christians, we are not those who are seeking to just push the envelope of temptation. How close can I get to the edge before actually committing the external act of sin? When you're beginning to toy with temptation, to play with temptation, to willingly open yourself up to temptation, the first motions have begun. You've already indulged in a sin. Seek to put even the first arousal of temptation to death. In conclusion, whether it be the first motions of sin or external acts of sin, we Christians still struggle with sin due to our remaining corruption. Therefore, look to Christ daily. Look to Christ daily, for He alone sets us free from sin. And that statement again from Romans, that sin no longer has dominion over you, claim that truth. Receive that truth. Believe that truth. If you are actually realizing that you indulge a lot in those thought sins and that you sort of sit idly by when the first motions of sin um, flow out from your heart and come upon you, don't feel crippled. Don't feel crushed by the weight of the realization. I actually do have so much. See, that's one of the things that happens when you study the biblical doctrine of sin and God's standards of his law and all that stuff. The more you study it, the more you go, oh, I have even more sin than I thought last week. And you study it more, and you go, I have even more sin than I thought five years ago. I've actually got so much sin. And it's good. Not it's, it's not good that you have so much sin. It is good that you come to see that. It is good that you come to recognize that. It is good that you begin to realize that because the more you realize how sinful you still actually are, the more dependent you will be on the grace of God for help the more dependent you will be and the more you will be seeking to rest in the gospel because once you see that pile of sin, you will see that if I were the one who is in charge of taking care of all of these sin problems, I would grow weak and weary and it would all but crush me to death. But no, Christ is the one that I can trust in. Christ bears that sin burden so that I could be set free and that sin would have no more dominion over me. So be encouraged. If you are struggling with that kind of inordinate desires that you've been just allowing to step all over you, know this, it does not have to be that way. You don't have to remain that way. You can repent, you can turn to Christ, you can seek His help. There is change, there is transformation, there is sanctification in Him. I want to end with a prayer from um, Thomas Vincent, but before that, any, any questions before we close in prayer? 
if uh, Francis Turretson says that we're totally not in control of the, um, or not, not wholly in control of the... Yeah. Um, Neither the wholly voluntary, nor in our power. Yeah. Right, so if it's not within our power, then how can we repent of it? Yeah, so what I, I think, reading him charitably, I don't think what he means there is that um, we had no active responsibility in it whatsoever. What he means there is that we are not, it is not wholly voluntarily as compared to premeditated acts of sin. Both are still sin, but there's a difference. So thanks for the question of clarification. Sam's got one. Just on, on the issue of homosexuality, yeah. you, um, you were saying how there's different schools of thought with this. So first of all, you've got, people will say that yes, both the act of homosexuality is wrong, and just as committing adultery or fornication is wrong mm. uh, with the opposite sex. Then underneath that, you've got someone who will say the lusting is wrong of homosexuality, just as the lusting of someone of the opposite right, sex Right, because it's is. sexual. Yep, so and it's not your spouse. Yeah, so then at that point, it's both are agreeing. The first motions, it seems, are actually wrong. But then if you go underneath that again, mm. I think you were saying something different. Uh, yes, there's a deeper this, motion. Yeah, yeah, so the, the deeper first motion, if that is the best way <laughs> to put it. The first first motion. The, the motion before the first motion. The first motion, but, that yeah. first notion <laughs> yeah, so that... Um, you're attracted at all to the same sex sure. in that sense. Yeah, so uh, is that where the disagreement is? You'll have evangelicals who will both say that lust is a sin. Yes. But then there's a disagreement over where, whether the actual even inclination towards yes. that lusting Correct. actualizing into actual... Action. I think you put it really well, Sam. Both agree that lusting after someone who is not your spouse, male or female, um, is a sin, okay? It's sinful in the eyes of God. But the disagreement lies in the fact that there is that camp that would say, let's actually go extreme. There's a, we, we're actually pretty close with that camp that I've just sort of, <laughs> sort of poked a little bit. There's a more extreme camp, which I think we can all, mo many of us conservative evangelicals can clearly disagree with. And it's that camp that says, you can be, let's say, lifelong partners with someone of the same sex, so long as you don't give in to the sexual stuff. See? We, and I hope the, middle, the guys as well that I mentioned earlier, should all say th the desire to be in that kind of relationship, such as a married couple, just minus the sex, with someone that you would call maybe a husband or whatever, that already is an inordinate desire. That in itself is already disorderly, unnatural, and therefore sinful. And it goes against God's design. So going back closer to us then, so yes, that, that school of thought that says it's okay to be attracted to the same sex in that sense, so long as you don't start sexually lusting after them. So we would say, no, no, even the same-sex attraction itself is disorderly. And uh, it is something that needs to be repented of. It, but it is something you can continue to struggle with as a Christian. But it is something you need to seek to put to death by the power of God. Yeah. So what would you say to the person who says, I just can't simply repent of this? Like mm. it's not, yeah, what would you say to that person? Yeah, look, I can sympathize with that statement if what they mean is, I can't repent of it in the same way that if I wronged somebody and hurt them, I can repent and I can go to them and I can ask for forgiveness and seek reconciliation and show forth the fruits of repentance in that way. You can't repent like that in the same way as desires that are sometimes just raging in your heart. I can sympathize with that. So when we say that you need to repent of that, um, obviously, let's assume that you're not living a life in accordance with that. Okay. So that's not the concern. You're not acting on it. Praise God. I mean, even that, we should be praising God. We should be thanking God that you're not acting on those things. So maybe the confusion is in what we mean by repent. When we say you need to repent of that desire, right, it's similar to, let, let's just say somebody actually is addicted to food, right? And they've already gotten to the point where, you know, they've got a better diet, and they're not giving in to clear gluttony and all those things, and they're doing better. 
in those things, um, but they still always daydream about food. It's been an addiction to them. It's taken control of their life. It's been a big part of everything that they do on an every 45 minute basis, right? It's everything to them. So um, that person might say, I'm doing well in terms of the external acts, but in terms of my thoughts and my daydreaming throughout the day of the food that I used to have like thousands and thousands and thousands of calories and everything, I'm still thinking about that. So what we should be encouraging to that person. We should say like, okay, praise God. There's actually been change in the external acts and all those things. And it's safe for us to believe that that is coming from some heart change. As you continue walking in that way, continue praying and seeking the Lord's help to take away even the daydreams from you. Because we all know it's not really that much fun having a new kind of lifestyle and still daydreaming about the old. So in the same way, you've come to the point, maybe this person was a former active homosexual. And they've come to the point where they've cut off all of those external acts. And it's no longer the way they live. It's no longer a part of their life. And they realize um, how sinful it is in the eyes of God. A person who recognizes that should not be okay with or enjoy still considering those sins. Still thinking positively in any way about those sins. Or simply still desiring those sins. And sometimes it takes time. You cut off the actual activities, but some of those desires are still in you. What we mean by repentance is to seek the Lord's forgiveness for those things and to ask for his help that your actions and the actual desires of your heart would begin to comply, would begin to be consistent with each other. It's like, I know I should, okay, this is more natural. Um, it's not that disorderly, but I know I should go to church and I should assert myself and I should really listen to the sermon. And I used to not go to church. Now I'm super diligent. I never miss church. But when I'm at church, sometimes I don't want to be there. So the solution is not, oh, you don't want to be there anyway, don't. No, the solution is keep going to church and continue seeking the Lord's help that where you are physically, your heart might be spiritually. That's what I that's think good. that's what I meant when I said repent. <laughs> I think you had yeah, some good... Last question, Ben. Yeah, good answers there at the end that ties into what I want to ask. I want to ask yeah, a bit more about uh, addictions or mm. um, uh, even mental health or, or situations where I guess what, what we would be saying w would also be that we live in a fallen world. Uh, there's limitations on a, on a finite form. And, and mm. with the brokenness of the fallen world is sometimes a broken physiology that affects how it adds hurdles to people's ability to to even navigate those desires that people can be very weak because of physiological brokenness uh mental health or physical health that means resisting some of those desires is, is very hard and that can arrive through xyz reason substance abuse or yep. even just you're born that way and that's what yep. god calls you but um, so you just want to, yeah, uh, affirming how, how does that fit in? How, how would you, um, what would you add to that? Mm, um, yeah, it, it's a good question. Look, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to be a doctor, right? But I do think, <laughs> I'm going to sound like a doctor. No, I do think, <laughs> I do think we need to distinguish between things that are behavioral and things that are legitimately clinical, okay? So a lot of what is trying to be deemed clinical and therefore completely excusable objectively probably is more behavioral. And it has more to do with your habits and behavior and a certain pattern of living and thinking that you've gotten accustomed to that someone along the way that, ha that had a medical profession was willing to slap something that sounded clinical upon it. Now, again, not a doctor. But I do still think that we need to distinguish between these things. Given that, let's just say we're good at distinguishing those things. Um, yeah, those things which are habitual, behavioral, those things that we've actually formed as patterns ourselves or patterns of our upbringing, whatever it may be, um, we need to take those very, very seriously because there are such things as sins that are sort of inculcated to you through upbringing, through culture and stuff like that that you become accustomed to. And it's harder to kick because you've just been living that way all the time. Things which are truly clinical, when we say mental illness, oh, what a huge spectrum, right? But truly clinical, where there might actually be something wrong with the brain. Yeah, I'm talking about like manias and... Yeah, something actually wrong with the brain. And not just the elusive chemical imbalance, right? But let's just, let's just say something's actually wrong with the person's brain. Um, and that is something we would concede 
is a natural hindrance to a lot of people, um, a natural hindrance from following a normal course, uh, a normal pattern when it comes to how to overcome these hurdles, how to overcome these things. So we need to deal with them with charity and, and with grace and with understanding, much like we would deal with somebody that has a very severe physical illness. There are many things commanded of Christians that we need to do, but if you are truly um, incapacitated because of a physical illness, most people in church would be understanding why you're not there doing that stuff, right? You've got a broken leg or you've got this going on. You've got all those things. Similarly, we should, um, we should approach the issues with the mind, issues with the brain. If they're legitimate clinical issues, um, we need to approach that with, with charity as well. That being said, we do believe that grace perfects nature. And we do believe that with the help of God, even people in those conditions, in their own spheres and within their own capacities, um, they can still fight sin. Mm. And if it is actual legitimate sin, they, they can seek God's help and they can seek the church's help. Yeah, that, that statement there that you alluded to earlier is very similar. I mean, it is what the CCF material and David Pallison all yes. kind of conclude. There is a, a, David Pallison is cool. a growth there that it's hard for us to understand and observe, but it's the same kind of yes. uh, progressive sanctification. Correct. And you can't just write them off just because they have a condition and just excuse everything on the basis of that. Yeah. Well, why don't we pray? I want to use a prayer from Thomas Vince, uh, Vincent, who wrote an explanation of the Assembly Shorter Catechism um, with a, a bit of an additional um, ending from me. Let's pray. We humbly confess and bewail that the covenant being made with Adam for himself and his posterity, we who descend from him by ordinary generation sinned in him and fell with him. And now, O Lord, most holy and just, we are guilty before thee. We have lost original righteousness and our whole nature is corrupted, whereby we are apt and prone to all manner of actual transgressions which proceed from this, our original sin. We acknowledge that for our sin we are justly deprived of communion with thee and fallen under the, thy wrath and curse and made liable to all the miseries of this life, to death itself and to the pains of hell forever. Oh, we have daily broken thy commandments in thought, word, and deed, and our sins are very heinous in thy sight because of many aggravations. Have mercy in us then, O Lord. Forgive us our sins through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us grace to resist the devil. Put sin to death and walk in righteousness by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.